so if I can have your attention, uh, we'll get started. So this, thank you all for coming to the HPL seminar this week. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Justin Say, um, who's a new postdoc here at uh, working at the Foothills campus with Sarah Mansky, who's here as well in the audience. So uh, before I hand it over, I just wanted to say a few quick words. So he got his academic start um, at the frigid but beautiful campus of the University of Saskatchewan. He started with his undergraduate degree in microbiology and immunology before taking a little detour where he did a master's in geological sciences at the same university. There he studied selenium bioaccumulation and localization within sediments using a whole bunch of um, different imaging modalities. So synchrotron-based x-ray, x-ray absorption spectroscopy, x-ray fluorescence imaging, and I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, after his master's, he went on to do a PhD at the University of Western Ontario, where he used dual energy CT to, stu to study osteoarthritis. And that's actually the work that he'll be talking about with us today that he did with Dr. David W. Holdsworth. He recently graduated in 2018 before, as I mentioned, joining us here at Foothills working with Dr. Sarah Mansky. His current work involves uh, multimodal imaging to study rheumatoid arthritis. But he did mention that he's also very much interested in keeping up with uh, this dual energy CT work, using it to look at different um, conditions such as quantification of gout or bone marrow edema. So um, when I asked him what his interests were, uh, he mentioned that he really, really likes rock climbing, but unfortunately he's very new here and really doesn't know very many good spots. So I remembered that a few weeks ago we had Eric was also really into rock climbing. So, you know what, Justin? I don't, hopefully we'll be able to get you some good academic contacts after your talk today. But if not, at least you'll have a lot of people who can talk to you about rock climbing. So with that said, I'll just hand it over. Awesome, thank you very much. Is this too loud for people in the back? Okay, I'm just, no? He's shaking his head, she's nodding. Just keep dropping the mic. No, better? That's good, that's good. Awesome. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Ifaz. Um, as he pointed out, I'm just basically going to be talking about my PhD work, which is just titled Analysis of Subchondral Bone and Microvessels Using a Novel Vascular Perfusion Contrast Agent and Optimized Dual Energy CT. Before I go into any of this, I just have to acknowledge there's a lot of people that helped me through my PhD. My advisory committee, Drs. David Holdsworth, Maria Drangova, and Frank Beyer, and a huge, huge support group that I got at Western University. And of course, the following funding agencies that make all of the following research and results even possible. So I'm pretty sure I don't have to convince most of you that osteoarthritis or OA is bad. But for, unfortunately, for those who are still sitting on the fence, just consider the following. It affects 10% of the Canadian population over the age of 15. Unfortunately, more and more people are being affected every day with it expected to more than double to 25% or 9 million Canadians by 2030. This chronic debilitating joint disease is characterized by cartilage and bone degeneration and joint space narrowing. Symptomatically, it manifests as stiff joints, painful joints, and limited joint mobility. So you can imagine with all of these factors together, this kind of, it, it results in an overall decrease in quality of life. Unfortunately, there's no cure. We have no disease-modifying drug that can halt and reverse the cartilage and bone degeneration associated with this disease. What we can offer you is a total joint replacement. Unfortunately, these aren't permanent solutions as they themselves require replacements every 15 to 20 years. And every time you go under the knife, you're actually further increasing the healthcare burden or the cost of this on our healthcare system, which is already exceeding $3 billion annually. And with the ever-increasing population of affected individuals, this is again going to double by 2031. And every time you undergo one of these surgeries, you also increase your risk of complications such as infection, joint failure, or joint uh, implant failure. So one of the reasons we believe we don't actually have a cure for this is we don't fully understand the mechanisms by which osteoarthritis initiates and progresses. We do have many factors that are associated with osteoarthritis such as obesity, genetics, diabetes, and uh, prior existing injuries but we don't really have a common thread to tie these all together. Now, one interesting hypothesis that's kind of re-arisen over the years revolves around the blood supply of the joint, whereby our bones need a huge amount, or our bones are under constant remodeling. 
due to the physical and environmental stresses around us. So they're not like the steel girders within the frame of this building and remain constant over time. The bones require a huge amount of blood just for the uh, diffusion of nutrients and oxygen, as well as inflammatory molecules. But it also uses the exact same blood supply for the removal of carbon dioxide and cellular waste products. And to just give you an idea of how expansive and how necessary this blood vessel network is, in terms of microvessels, so the smallest vessels that we have in a body, these are capillaries on the order of 10 microns or one tenth the diameter of single human hair. If you were to lay them end to end in a single human, there are more than 40,000 kilometers of these capillaries. So you could imagine that adverse changes to this diverse and uh, massive vascular network would be detrimental for bone formation. And these adverse, change, adverse changes can come in two forms. You can have a decrease in blood flow, so that would result in a decrease in oxygen and nutrient flow to the joint. But conversely, you can have an increase. So you can have an increase in inflammatory molecules to the joint. So being able to simultaneously study both microvessels and bone would be greatly beneficial in further understanding osteoarthritis. Now we can already get images, this is depicted on the left here, where I have a knee joint, and you can see the main arterial blood supply of this knee joint. And we can get this through MRI or ultrasound. As most of us know, x-rays and CT is great for already doing bone characterization, where we can clearly see in this osteoarthritic joint, joint space narrowing versus the uh, other side, and then the formation of bone spurs or bony growths. So ideally, if we could have an imaging technique that could combine these two image, uh, metrics, then we would have this, we'd have a way to actually characterize both microvessels and bone changes in osteoarthritis. Now, as x-rays are already great for characterizing bone, and it actually has the resolution necessary to detect microvessels, it would be a great technique to do it. But the main reason we can't use CT is due to the following three reasons. As I've alluded to before, microvessels are very small, 10 microns. They also lack any inherent contrast when visualized using x-rays, so they make them indistinguishable from surrounding soft tissue. And to confound this fact, you're trying to now distinguish something that can, you can barely see with very dense bone. So the solution to this is actually quite simple. You give it contrast, and we do this. Clinically, we give them iodine-based contrast agents. So when you go for an angiogram, they actually pump you full of iodine. And this can actually give you these massive, you can see the big arteries, you can see the femoral arteries with no problem. The issue arises is that even though you're, con you're giving contrast enhancement to these vessels, you cannot distinguish them from the nearby dense bone. So what do we have preclinically? Well, we have barium-based contrast agents which give significantly enhanced contrast enhancement to these vessels, but the problem is barium tends to fall out of suspension, blocking the vessels and preventing any downstream perfusion. This is why it's strictly done in ex vivo postmortem samples. And the current gold standard that we have are lead-based contrast agents, which give significantly enhanced contrast to the perfused vessels, but now in terms of grayscale values alone, they're actually on the same order of bone, making, the in, making them distinguished very difficult. So this led to the three objectives in my, project, my thesis project, which were first to develop a novel preclinical vascular perfusion contrast agent to enable the visualization of these microvessels, to optimize dual energy computed tomography, and this technique is important because it actually facilitates the automatic segmentation of subchondral bone and vessels, as I'll go into later. And third, to implement or combine these two te techniques to simultaneously study microvessels and bone in an osteoarthritic animal model. So I'm just gonna start with my first project. So for those who've never seen one, this is a typical preclinical micro CT scanner. This is, happens to be the one that was located at the Robarts Research Institute at the University of Western Ontario. And for the majority of my results, they, this was my workhorse. This is where a lot of my results came from. To make an optimal contrast agent for microvessels, it had to fulfill certain requirements. First, it had to be comprised of an elemental composition that maximized the X-ray absorption near the mean energy of a preclinical scanner operating at 90 kVp. That is, you wanted to be comprised of something that can absorb as many photons as possible. It obviously had to be of low viscosity and small molecular size so that it can pass through the capillaries with ease. And finally, the main reason, it has to provide significant contrast enhancement to these vessels. What I'm showing here is just the typical output X-ray spectrum 
of a 90 kVp scanner with energy in kV on the x-axis and photon flux on the y. The dotted blue or black line represents the mean energy of this spectrum. So we want a contrast agent comprised of an element that would maximize the amount of absorption here. As such, I chose erbium with an absorption cage at 57.5 keV or where this green line is. That shaking is really something else, eh? Um, now, not only did I choose it for the elemental composition, but the, there are other beneficial factors that came with it. It's readily available in nanoparticular form. That is, I can buy erbium oxide with a nominal diameter of 50 nanometers. And for those who just don't know the nomenclature, one nanometer is a thousand times smaller than a micron. So that's great. It's relatively inex inexpensive at a dollar a gram, making the cost of perfusioning animals not a limiting factor. And there are no known toxic effects associated with erbium oxide, making it very safe to handle and prepare. Now, before I go on, I want to stress that all the results I'm about to show you were done on post-mortem ex vivo samples. This contrast agent that I'm proposing does not yet work on live animals. Towards the end of my PhD, I did have the pleasure of collaborating with a PhD student working on the live or the in vivo application of this, so I'm excited to see our results. But everything from here on in is post-mortem. So back to my contrast agent. It came down to a two-part contrast agent. First, a two-part silicone elastomer that had erbium oxide nanoparticles embedded within, and a curing agent. Now, the reason I opted for a curing silicone so that I could form a cast of the perfused vessels was it, because it would give me an unlimited amount of time to actually analyze the efficacy of my erbium-based contrast agent. The two-part silicone elastomer that I chose is MV132. Essentially, it is a brother of the previously mentioned lead-based contrast agent. The only difference is it's a clear silicone elastomer and contains zero lead. And the curing agent was made in-house. It was a two-part curing agent comprised of dibulatin dilerate and tetraether ether silicate. Now, this is where I ran into the first problem of my PhD, as I'm sure all of you know. <clears throat> Nothing in life is simple. I couldn't take the nanoparticles, which were sold to me at 50 nanometers, and throw them into the silicone and be done with it. In fact, what happens is that these nanoparticles naturally aggregated into large aggregates of 10 microns. Now, if you remember, a capillary is 10 micron. So only one of these aggregates was necessary to block this capillary and prevent any downstream perfusion. So to break these up, I employed probe sonication. This is what I was using for five years. And for those who don't know what probe sonication does, essentially I take electrical current or electrical um, yeah, current and I turn it into high frequency vibrations on the order of 20 kilohertz. These high frequency vibrations cause uh, intense shockwaves within the silicone media that essentially rip apart these aggregates back down to nanometer size. As a visual representation, here's a confocal fluorescence microscopy where you see on the left is the presonication. You can see one of these large 10 micron aggregates and then postsonication, all their aggregates are gone and everything's back down to nanometer level. Now this is great, but the problem is this only kind of provides you with a small snapshot of what I'm comparing. So to show you, the whole entire solution that I'd be preparing, or the whole entire volume of, uh, that I'd be probe sonicating, we did dynamic light scattering, or DLS. Essentially, what I do is I run a laser through the sample, and it measures the rate at which particles fall out of suspension. I have particle size in nanometer plotted on the X and volume fraction on the Y. And what you can see now is that I have a distribution centered around 70 nanometers, plus or minus two. So this is great. All my, nanopart all my nanoparticles are back down to a size that can perfuse down to capillaries. We then did viscosity measurements on it, and we came out with a viscosity of 20 millipascals second. To give you an idea, similar to coffee creamer. And this is great because the manufacturer reported viscosity of just the silicon itself was 19.2. So even with all the extra erbium oxide that I'm adding, it doesn't significantly affect the viscosity. So now that I've proved that I have a contrast agent with the physical properties that can actually perfuse an animal, I actually actually had to do that. So all my initial experiments will be done on mice just because they are the smallest rodent animal research model. And here's a typical mouse. I have arteries in red, veins in blue, and some organs of interest labeled in black. And to perfuse mice, I would inject it via the heart so that the contrast agent would follow the arterial supply and then come out through the venous supply. I then took this mouse and I scanned it at a single 90 kVp 
uh, CT scan to obtain the following image. Now, for those who are new to X-rays or CT, typically in a non-contrast enhanced image, when you don't have an exogenous outside contrast agent, bone will be the brightest object in this image, simply because it is the densest, most naturally occurring object in the body. But as you can see here, it's actually the profuse vessels that are appearing brighter or more intense than the surrounding skeletal structures. And what's great about this image is how closely it mimics the depiction on the right, where I can see the heart, the profuse hind limbs, and the kidneys. Now this is just a maximum intensity projection, so I'm just kind of viewing it from a top-down view. To give you an idea of actually its full perfusion, I'm going to be presenting you a video where I'm slicing through it sagittally, that is from side to side, and I just want you to note that all the organs are lighting up because of the perfuse contrast agent. Oh, sorry. No? Back one more? Play. And of note are things like the long bones where you see vessels inside the femurs. You see the beautiful kidney. And as the aorta runs down the spine, you can kind of see the branching into each individual vertebral body. And as this video continues, you can see the other kidney and the other long bone perfusions. Now that was fast, which is fine, because what I'm gonna show you here puts it as a still image. So I took the hind limbs in red and the spine in green and I scanned it at a higher resolution to obtain the following. In the hind limbs, you can see a dot within each long bone, within each femur, each tibia, and represented by the red arrows. The yellow arrow is just kind of representing the doubling, so we see the artery and the associated vein. And if I were to reorient what I have in panel A, I can actually now see this dot become a whole entire vessel that runs down the entire length of the femur. So not only is this showing that I have a continuous perfusion, but it's also showing, it's also alluding to how well vascularized this bone is. And for the spine in green, the main takeaway from this is I can now see foramens, or these are openings or passages in bone that allow the passage of vessels in and out. But what I haven't demonstrated yet is his ability to perfuse capillaries. I've shown that I can perfuse capillaries by its physical properties, but I still haven't visually shown you that. So what I, den what I then did was I excised this perfuse kidney and I scanned it the highest resolution capable or available to us at the time, which was five microns. And I chose the kidney because it's a well-ordered structure and because it's comprised of thousands upon thousands of glomeruli, which are capillary beds that are responsible for the majority of your blood filtration in your kidney. And what I'm about to show you is, I'm honestly very proud of it because I think it's the best image that I produced out of my PhD, even though it wasn't main, the main part of it. But I got the following image, where I can get a beautifully perfused kidney and attached adrenal gland. I run this through 3D visualization software and reorient it so I can now see an entire arterial branch from the aorta, aorta all the way down to the renal arteries and down to the glomeruli. And to zoom up, you can see individual glomeruli or capillary bundles. And what's more important from this zoomed up version is this afferent arterial, which feeds each glomeruli bundle and it is known to be about 13 microns. So I know, both quantitatively and visually, I'm perfusing capillaries. And finally, contrast enhancement. I took an ROI, or a region of interest in the heart, the testes, and the inferior vena cava. And the reason I chose these three regions of interest is because they represent the beginning, the middle, and the end of the perfusion route. And I compare this to cortical bone and the previously mentioned lead-based microfilm. And with CT number on the y-axis, you can see that in all three contrast enhanced regions, it is significantly higher than cortical bone and microfilm. So to summarize my first chapter, I successfully created a novel uh, erbium-based vascular con uh, contrast agent by homogeneously suspending nanoparticles of erbium oxide with probe sonication. I verified that the particle size was small enough and of low viscosity to perfuse capillaries, and I provided significantly <coughs> higher X-ray attenuation than commonly used, uh, commonly used lead-based contrast agents. So next up was optimizing dual energy CT. So what is dual energy CT? Some of you may not actually know what this is, but just to put it simply, it is a multi-spectral imaging technique. It is analogous to how we perceive color or red, green, blue, or RGB. 
It takes into account how every single material around us will absorb photons differentially across a spectrum. As a simple example, I'm going to start with red, green, blue, or the light spectrum. Now presented here, I have a bowl of blueberries and cranberries. The reason we can differentiate between these two small spherical fruits is because we instinctively can see the differences intensity changes based on different filtered conditions. What that means is, if I were to take this RGB image and apply a red filter to it, things that appear red will appear more intense or brighter in the red filtered image. So the cranberries, which have a lot of red color, appear brighter, while blueberries, which have very little red content, appear darker. Similarly, in a blue filtered image, blueberries appear brighter, while cranberries, with, which have very little blue content, appear darker. So our brain does all of this instinctively and is able to tell us the difference between a blueberry and cranberry. But what's also fascinating is that we can also tell the differences in ratios of intensities. And this is most noticeable if you look at green things such as the leaves, where it's not truly brighter or darker in one, but because of the differences in the intensity changes between these filtered conditions, we can tell that it's green. Now, dual energy CT works along a very, very similar process, except instead of the light spectrum, we're dealing with the X-ray spectrum, and instead of color, we're dealing with attenuation coefficients. So what I've plotted here with energy and KeV on the X-axis and attenuation coefficient on the Y, are the attenuation curves of erbium, bone, and soft tissue. And what I want you to notice is that as X-ray energy goes up, the attenuation coefficient goes down. Simply put, as X-ray energy increases, things become more transparent, with one marked difference, and that's this little peak in the erbium attenuation curve. And what that represents is the absorption K-edge energy of erbium at 57.5 keV. What that means is that at this exact moment, there's enough X-ray energy to kick out an inner core K-shell electron of erbium and result in a dramatic increase in X-ray absorption. So theoretically, coming back to the light analogy, if I could apply two filters, or in this case, two equal distributions of X-ray spectra above and below, or high and low energy scans around this absorption edge, I could theoretically subtract these two images and be left with only an erbium image. Again, there's always problems. CT scanners are inherently polychromatic. That is, you get a huge range of energies of below whatever energy you select. As an example, I have plotted here the um, output X-ray spectrum of a 57, 70, 80, and 90 kbp spectrum. Regardless of what I'm choosing, there's going to be overlap. And in addition to the overlap, you notice that the lower the energy, the lower the area under the curve, or the lower the photon flux. So how am I going to get this equal distribution from, from a problem that I get when I try to scan with CT scanners? And that was the objective of my second project, where I needed to develop the necessary X-ray filtration to facilitate the accurate decomposition of dual energy CT acquired images to develop a method to achieve subvoxel image co-registration. And this comes because the preclinical scanner that I showed you, in between energy scans, the bed is retracted to, uh, so that the scanner can obtain calibration images. And when it goes back, it's never in the right spot. It's never in the exact same spot. And finally, to design and fabricate an automated filter exchange mechanism to automate this whole acquisition process to eliminate any operator dependent errors. So again, here's the preclinical scanner. To do filtration, it's actually quite simple. A lot of scanners do this, if not most. What you do is you add a metal foil after the x-ray source before the sample. The problem is, none of these filters are really optimized for whatever you really wanted them to do. And to get in there, you have to open up your CT scanner and modify the gantry, which I'm sure a lot of people are hesitant to do. So what are you left with? Well, you're left with this. I have to put the filter on the sample. The problem with this is that the sample is stationary and the X-ray source and detector rotate on a gantry. So you can see very quickly that at some points, you're not going to get proper filtration across the sample. But hypothetically, if I were to iterate this filter through over 360 degrees, I'm left with this shape. So I know what shape of filter I need. I need a cylindrical filter around the sample. Easy enough. Next up, what are my two energies? What are my low and high energies that I'm going to choose? I started off with the easiest case, high energy, 90 kbp, the max energy I could get. 
The reason being gives me the maximum amount of photon flux, so I can apply as much filtration as I want to reduce the photon flux to match low energy, but also because the mean energy already starts really close to erbium. The problem came with the low energy. What do you choose? If I choose below 57.5 keV, then I get very low photon flux. So I have to scan for an abnormally long period of time. So what I did, I ended up doing was 57.5 keV. So this is above the absorption kh of erbium still, but I hope to show you why I chose this. It does give me adequate photon flux, which is very important because as soon as I apply filtration, I'm losing some of that photon flux. So this is great. I have the energy, I have the psi, I have the cylindrical shape. What am I going to make the filters out of? Well, for high energy, it was actually quite simple. I could use copper. Copper will selectively attenuate low energy photons. So what that does is I start shifting the mean energy of this high energy spectrum further to the right, and I'm also at the same time reducing the photon flux. So that's great. This is higher. Area under the curve is going to get less as soon as, as soon as I put copper filters in. But what about the low energy? I'm still above the absorption edge of erbium. So the best way to get rid of photons above the absorption k edge, k edge of erbium is actually to use erbium itself. So this makes sense. If I put an erbium foil around my erbium perfused sample, that foil will absorb the high energy photons before it can get to the sample. Simulating this, I get the following two spectrum. So now I see I get similar area under the curves, and I get better distribution or better separation of these two spectra that I've chosen. Buying copper foil is very easy. Any of you can buy it, and you can wrap it around an acrylic annular cylinder to create your high energy filter. That's not a problem. How do you create a copper foil filter, uh, erbium foil filter? When we sourced it, a one by one inch square of erbium was $1,000. So there's no way we're covering a sample with that. Uh, I think we were quoted for $20,000 just to have enough to go around the sample. So that's just ridiculous. So how do you create an erbium filter? Well, we came up with the following solution. We took an uh, aluminum rod, machined it down to the dimensions that I would need it to be, and created a two-part silicone mold. Using the cavity of this, I actually just poured in an off-the-shelf resin embedded with erbium oxide and allowed it to cure. And now I'm left with two filters, the high-energy filter just with foil around an acrylic core and a homogeneous erbium filter, which I made for 50 bucks. With regards to image co-registration, again, because the, there is inconsistency in bed reproducibility, how do you co-register the low and the high energy image? Um, most of you have probably already come across this. You just use fiducial markers, and that's all I did. I have a sample here, sits in this x-ray transparent foam bed, and throughout this foam bed, I've just pressed in 10 or 20 Teflon beads. And Teflon was chosen because they're easily segmented in the image, and they don't impart any artifact on the image. So you can see here, these are just all the fiducial markers. And finally, I wanted to automate the whole process because I don't want to be going in there manually switching these filters over the sample. So we built the following apparatus. This is a control box that controls this lead screw that just linearly actuates the high and the low energy filter above one field of view on the sample. So you have the sample here sitting in the bed with the fiducial markers. And here's a video of it in action. So what was great about this is this all happened automatically within the scanner bore. So I could leave my sample and just go home for the day. And the accumulation of all of these techniques only leads to two images, a low and a high energy image, filtered by the erbium, filtered by the copper. Now there is not many drastic differences to these images, but I hope you'll appreciate the subtle differences. So with regards to bone, Again, as energy, x-ray energy increases, things become more transparent. So you can see bone get brighter to darker in between the low and the high energy image. But what's interesting is the perfused vessels. Because the high energy image is now above the absorption cage of erbium, they don't actually get darker at all. If anything, they retain their brightness or they get brighter. By applying in-house decomposition algorithms, I can then decompose these two images into separate, distinct, quantitative volumes of bone, vasculature, and what I don't show here is soft tissue, but it's essentially the remainder of the image.
So what I want you to appreciate is like, this is SB3. This is a bone mimicking calibrator. It's complete omission in the vascular image kind of denotes how good of a decomposition algorithm, decomposition I'm doing. And before any of you ask, while this looks like misclassification of bone, this is actually the endosteum and periosteum or these blood sheaths inside and outside of bone. So that's why it looks like the bone. I can, I can then take these 3D volumes and do something cool and put them through 3D visualization software to get the following type of movie, where you can get the bone only image rotate. And as it rotates, the blood vessel, uh, the profuse vessel only image will kind of come into view and occupy the space around and inside the bone. And then finally, as the video finishes, it's going to zoom in and pro provide you with a cross-sectional view of the femur and tibia. And it's going to really show you how much vascularity the bone actually has. <clears throat> so as you can see here, there's a lot more vessels, especially for me, than I was initially expecting. So to conclude my second part of my thesis, I have successfully implemented dual energy CT on a preclinical cone beam micro CT scanner. And I did this using the combination of the results from project one, which is the erbium based vascular perfusion contrast agent, but also developing a method that allow me to create customized x-ray filters of essentially any shape, size, and elemental composition, image co-registration, and a automated filter exchange mechanism to automate the whole acquisition process. And now finally, my last part of my thesis was to combine the results of these two projects and actually simultaneously studied vessel and bone changes in an animal model of osteoarthritis. Now it's been approximately 25 minutes since I did OA, so I talked about OA, so we need a little refresher, right? This is just a depiction of a regular joint where you just have two bone ends they have an articular cartilage or a low friction smooth gliding surface, and you have a synovial membrane encapsulating the whole entire thing. Now on the left is a normal joint, on the right is an osteoarthritic joint. As I mentioned, osteoarthritis is char characterized by cartilage and bone degeneration, but what causes it? So our first thing was to look at kind of cartilage, because cartilage is an avascular tissue. That means it has no vessels. But cartilage is a funny thing in that it does undergo remodeling and repair. So how is it doing this if there's no blood vessels? It needs oxygen and nutrition to do this. And there are two hypotheses to how it's getting this. The first one is from the highly vascularized synovium. So vessels lining the synovium allow for the passive diffusion of oxygen and nutrition through the synovial fluid into the cartilage. The second one, and is less studied, is looking at the subchondral bone region directly underlying the articular cartilage. It makes sense, it's close by, and I've just shown you that it's highly vascularized. So, you know, expecting diffusion of oxygen and nutrition across this barrier is not unreasonable. And we do know that in late stages of osteoarthritis, there is vascular invasion from the subchondral bone into the cartilage. And because cartilage is avascular, when it starts to see these vessels, it starts degrading itself because it's not used to seeing these things. So what model of osteoarthritis do I want to use? Well, we opted for a surgical one, an anterior cruciate ligament transection and partial medial meniscectomy, or ACLX and PMM surgery. The reason being, this surgical model exhibits the early subchondral bone changes that we see in early OA within humans. Now, for those who don't know, there are two ligaments in your knee, the anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. In a transection, all we do is we cut the anterior, or the one in the front. This causes joint destabilization. And for a partial medial meniscectomy, we remove the medial aspect of the meniscus, or this kind of cushioning barrier between the two joints. That way, every time the joint is loaded, you're destabilized and you're introducing direct bone-on-bone -bone grinding. As I mentioned, I'm interested in the subchondral bone region directly underneath the articular cartilage. And these, I've, they're, they're known as a distal femoral epiphysis and proximal tibial epiphysis. To study these, I chose the Sprague Dolly rat model. So I had 54 Sprague Dolly rats. Six went to zero week controls, no surgeries on them. 
The remaining 48 were divided into four time points, one, two, four, and eight weeks postoperatively. And within each of those time points, they were further subdivided into two surgery groups, the sham surgery as well as the ACLX or OA surgery. The reason we did a sham surgery, which just involved opening up the joint capsule and then suturing it immediately so we don't touch the ACL or the meniscus, was if you could imagine if you had an OA surgery on your ipsilateral leg, your contralateral, your non-operated leg, is going, you're going to start compensating with that leg. So to eliminate any variability due to that, we did a sham surgery. Because my contrast agent requires dead animals, these are all endpoints, and at each endpoint, we perfused, dual energy CT scanned, co-registered, and decomposed them, again, uh, just a reminder, as into quantitative volumes of soft tissue, bone, and vasculature. Now, upon coming here, I find that you guys have automated segmentation techniques, which I'm very jealous of. I manually, manually contoured 108 of these little things. So to do that, I basically manually contoured following the cortical shell and the growth plate of each femur and tibia, the each distal femoral epiphysis and proximal tibial epiphysis, every 200 microns until the entire joint had been encapsulated, giving me this 3D volume of interest. Because my low, high, and soft tissue bone and vascular images are all inherently co-registered with one another, I can take this volume of interest and superimpose it into all of those decomposed volumes and collect a mean value. And what that mean value represents is the voxel volume fraction. That is, for example, if I take this volume of interest and plop it into the bone only image, I get one value and that one value represents out of that whole volume of interest, what fraction of it was bone. And the remainder of that refraction will be comprised of vasculature and soft tissue and it's forced to add up to one. So doing this for 108 hind limbs and tabulating all the results, this is what I get. <clears throat> With femurs on top, tibias on bottom, sham surgeries on the left, ACLX on the right, I have endpoints plotted on the x-axis and voxel volume fractures on the y. And what I'm comparing here is only the ipsilateral operated hind limb versus the contralateral, contralateral non-operated hind limb within each individual time point. For soft tissue, I see no significant differences within each individual time point. Same goes for bone. Again, femur on top, tibia on bottom, sham on left, ACLX on right. I see no significant differences when I'm looking, comparing the ipsilateral operated versus contralateral non-operated. And finally, the microvessels. Finally, with femur on top, tibia on bottom, sham on the left, ACLX on right. No significant differences, except for one which is one week post-operatively within the tibia of the ACLX. So I see a significant increase in vasculature within the operated tibia versus the non-operated tibia. The problem is, or I shouldn't say problem, what happens is by about two weeks and for the remainder of the, for the, remainder of the study, this significant change actually disappears. So this probably tells me that this significant increase could probably just due to an inflammatory response to the actual surgery itself. So to summarize the third chapter, I have successfully implemented the novel erbium-based contrast agent, optimized dual energy CT, and an animal model of osteoarthritis to simultaneously study the subchondral bone and microvessels. But that's not exactly the end of it. So I show no difference, but does that mean the whole vasculature hypothesis is kind of out of the, is it useless? And that's not true. A lot of the results, a lot of the research lately has been pointing to the synovium anyway. So it actually has been known that a lot of the cartilage receives its nutrients from the synovium. It just wasn't sure how much. So because I dual energy CT scanned the whole entire knee joint, I'm not just scanning the distal femoral epiphysis or the proximal tibial epiphysis. I can actually retroactively go back into the data and contour out the synovium, which is exactly what I did for this preliminary analysis, where I contoured out the synovium every 200 microns to create a 3D volume of interest. Taking that and plopping that into the vascular only image, I can give you a single slice MIP or a maximum intensity projection where red denotes vasculature. So the more red, the more vasculature. And you can just see how much vessels are just around the joint in one MIP. But if I were to take the whole volume of interest, you see that there's actually a lot of vasculature around this joint. So the synovium is definitely another place to be looking forward to and a, a more reason to go back into the data and contour this out. 
Now, I've only applied dual energy CT for osteoarthritis. I created this contrast agent and optimized dual energy CT for osteoarthritis. But what I want to emphasize that it's not just for osteoarthritis. And during my PhD, I actually had a lot of great opportunities to form collaborations, one of which actually involved cancer. So collaborating with a fellow PhD student at uh, University of Western Ontario, he was interested in looking at the tortuosity or kind of the complexity of the tumor vasculature. And he was interested at in looking at it before and after the admission of an anti-angiogenic drug. Now, for those who don't know, cancer results in a large increase in vessel growth. It needs all of these blood and nutrients to support its growth. So this is known as angiogenesis. So by giving an anti-angiogenic drug, theoretically you're knocking this out and reducing the tumor size and uh, reducing cancer. The problem with it is, he was interested in looking at it with microbubbles and ultrasound, but this particular cancer cell line had an ability to calcify the vessels. So ultrasound can't really see well into, uh, into bone or calcifications, and CT has a very hard time distinguishing between these calcified vessels and bone. So he came to me to try to employ my urbane-based contrast agent in dual energy CT. And while this is not actually the results of it, I'm just showing you my contribution to the project. We perfused the mouse, and this mouse had a breast cancer cell line embedded in the mammary fat pad. We excised the tumors and scanned them at, at high resolution, and with no drug develop, with no drug administration, so no anti-angiogenic drug, you can see the nice tumor vascular encapsulation. But post anti-angiogenic um, administration, so after you've kind of stopped any vessel growth, we can see the disrupted vascular network. Moving on, I then worked with another PhD student in the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology, also at the University of Western Ontario. And he was interested in looking at the relationship between intervertebral disc degeneration or IBD degeneration and back pain. And their hypothesis was quite simple. IBDs are like cartilage, they're avascular, so they are not used to having vessels and uh, vessels in them. So his idea is that upon degeneration, there may be a vascular and nerve invasion into the IBDs, and that's what's promoting back pain. And due to the proximity of the uh, vertebral bodies, again, they were interested in my ability to not only perfuse capillaries, but distinguish between uh, nearby bone. So shown here on the left is a control mouse. So what you see here is the IBD or lack of IBD. We're not gonna see that in a CT image. Spinal column, and the red arrow is pointing to like a periphery capillary that we were seeing uh, next to the IBD. And in their CCN2 deficient knockout mouse, so these are the mice that undergo IBD degeneration, we again see the IBD and a periphery vessel, but what we don't see is any vascular invasion into the IBD. So that hypothesis may not necessarily be true in this case. <clears throat> now all of this work is still done preclinically and as Ifaz mentioned, I'm very interested in still pursuing dual energy CT. So I've only been here since June, but since June I've had the pleasure of already starting two new collaborations focused on the clinical, implement clinical implementation of dual energy CT. The first of which is a collaboration with Dr. Zbansky, Pochard, uh, McMillan is a ra uh, rheumatologist, Salat, I think it's Salat, is a radiologist, and future Dr. Condro, which I actually don't know what department he is, engineering probably? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, and they're interested in looking at gout. Now, gout has been analyzed with dual energy CT for years, but what I bring to the table and what my handling of the data brings to the table is I have a much, a significantly higher sensitivity or detection of gout or monosodium urate than what is clinically out there. So what we see is in a high energy image, this is a gout patient. You have the bone only foot and the MSU or monosodium urate. So you can see the hyperaccumulation of these crystals or into tophi. So you can see this from this, but this just gives you a higher sensitivity. And more recently, I've been also collaborating with, again, Dr. Zmanskis, Dr. DeBacker, and Dr. Boyd, and they're interested in looking at bone marrow edema, and they're interested in using dual energy CT as kind of a supplement or replacement of MRI due to the long wait times and high cost of MRI. So on the left is a T2 MRI, and you can see the hyperintense region here denoting the bone marrow edema. And upon decomposition, I can get a marrow image, 
the bone, uh, the edema image and my bone only image. So you can see the nice correlation between the gold standard MRI image and my dual energy CT de decomposed image. So basically dual energy CT doesn't have to be for osteoarthritis. It doesn't have to need an erbium contrast agent. It is a very versatile technique. So how do I summarize everything I talked about today? Basically, I developed an erbium-based vascular perfusion contrast agent. I optimized preclinical dual energy CT to provide a semi-automated visualization, segmentation, and quantification of soft tissue, bone, and vessels. I measured, unfortunately, the lack of vessel and bone changes in an osteoarthritic animal model over time, and I've had the pleasure of collaborating and applying my expertise in dual energy CT into multiple applications. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So there were three months of age at the initiation of the study. So the zero week controls would have been three months and then eight weeks controls would have been five and a half months by the end of sacking. In terms of the ORSI score, that's still ongoing. The reason being histology on 108 samples is not easy and very time consuming as you know. So what I do have is, I don't have an ORSI score but I did do preliminary uh, histology. And we do know by uh, one to two weeks, we are seeing degeneration in the cartilage. So this is great because um, I should also preface this, that this model has been done previously. It was actually previously characterized by the exact same veterinary surgeon that I was using and the previous PhD student in my group. So, um, while I'm using, I'm trying to do as much as they did, uh, or at least uh, correlate as much as my uh, surgery model as they did, I am also showing, at least from these preliminary histology, that it correlates well with what they were seeing too. So this is still ongoing in the background, I hope. You may have to rephrase that one for me, sorry. So being able to basically subtract out the background noise from the inner joint space because they're not, the joint does not have any capillaries. On I see. Side. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the only way I could see that around is kind of like a pre and post image. So you'd need a control image to do that. Or you would just ROI the, in, the in area of interest, which you know shouldn't have any vascular, uh, vas vascularization. Yeah, you didn't miss that. Um, the mouse scans that I did were 100 micron voxels. The higher resolution for the hind limbs and the spine were done at 33 microns. And the highest resolution for the kidney was done at 5 microns. Uh, I should also add, all of the rat images that I did, all of the data analysis I did for my rat study were acquired at 100 micron voxels. Yeah, so partial volume is a huge issue. Um, it's up for debate. Uh, a lot of people think that dual energy CT is immune to partial volume effects just based on, it's a mathematical approach to break down what's in each voxel. I don't necessarily believe that. So what I have done, and I'm waiting on David to read the paper because it's ready for submission, is that I actually took a profuse sample, I scanned it at, 13 microns, and I took that image and I rebinned it two by two, three by three, four by four, and see how the uh, how the identical region of interest uh, measurement would change. 
And while I don't show, I do show a significant difference between 13 and I think the highest I did was whatever that's 100 and some microns. It really wasn't that that significant. There is a downward trend, but it wasn't of significance. So I don't believe it's immune. I just think we need. I just need more data to to show that. I want to play off that because the the impetus is you've got these micro vessels that are less than 10 microns. Yep. But your resolution is 100 micron. Um, so, so are you getting sub resolution? Uh, are you getting vessels that are less than 100 micron when you do these? Yes. Staining? For sure. So, now you're right. I, I am probably missing a very small fraction, the very, very small, like 10, like the individual 10 micron capillaries. But for one, all the animals where I scanned identically and treated identically. So within this confined study, the results are fine. If I were to compare them to other ones, it depends on parameters. But uh, in terms of smaller than 100 micron vessels, yes, because, again, it's a mathematical approach. Uh, I know that when I did a whole, there's a whole control study before this where I wanted to quantify how well my dual energy CT was working. So what I did is I took an animal, I perfused it, I drew an ROI in what I know is soft tissue, what I know is bone, and what I know is vessel, and I quantified it. And I saw, and when I drew an ROI in those decomposed images and saw how close they were to 100% essentially. And what I was seeing across the board is that my minimum, the lowest value that I got was 98.7% classification. So if anything, I'm missing 1.3% somewhere. So to me that means Yes, I'm seeing vessels smaller than 100 microns, but I'm missing 1.3, and it could be being classified as something else. Can I clarify what you mean when you say you see the vessels are smaller? As in, I detect them. You detect them as in your overall energy in that voxel? Yes, I detect them just based on its, essentially its grayscale value in the decomposed image. So yes, so sorry. You don't know exactly where in the pixels of voxel? No, I don't. You just so these are acquired at 100 microns, so anything less I'm not going to be seeing. But it contributes to that intensity value of that voxel, so yes. And then sticking with the registration question, yes. when you say sub voxel <coughs> image co-registration, but you have these beads yes. that are presumably not less than 1.6 millimeters. So oh. are you getting a better, re like, oh, yeah. so can the error in the registration actually be it could be huge if you're off. Right. But what we're using is a centroid program. So it's, these are spherical beads. So if I find the cent, if I isosurface them all with the same isosurface and find the centroid of them, theoretically, it should be subvoxel. And is that because there's it's like a least squares minimization of yes. lots of beads? Yes. Okay. It's a rigid registration too. Yeah. And I use at least ten beads for registration. Then you've got to recreate that image once it's been registered, right? You've got to... Um... Yes, it, there is a transformation. Yeah. Resampling, that's what It's I mean. resampling. And yeah, so I did test this out. I'm forgetting the exact mechanism by which I tested it out, but I did test it out and I found no significant differences between the two values using the exact same ROIs and then Again, getting the grayscale values from the end and then just writing stats on them. There was a question at the back. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the rhodium oxide. Yes. You said it will aggregate over time? Yes. So no, uh, they naturally aggregated. Over time? Uh, sorry. Yeah, Finish your question. That's my question. Sorry. Does it aggregate over time? Yeah. Does it be aggregate after you use <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately. So what is the time frame? That What's the shelf life? Yeah. I mean, when you inject it to the animal, how long? Okay, um, so what I was doing was I was preparing them a day in advance. So the reason I prepare them a day in advance is because even though I'm breaking them up, um, I would find that the next morning some would still settle out. So I'd always decant whatever that was and I used only the decanted portion. Um, but that decanted portion I've used up until about one to two weeks post sonication. I have done a two-year sample, which I made and forgot, and I decided to resonicate that for, you know, shits and giggles, 
and ran a DLS sample on that, and it's just as good as new. So if theoretically, it has an infinitely long shelf life, all you need to do is run a very quick five minute po uh, pre-sonication before use and you'll be good to go. But this all becomes moot once the PhD student develops the in vivo contrast agent, so, you know, yeah. So, sorry, pull up here. Yes. How long, wait, how long does it take for the imaging process? And yeah. you think within that time frame, the uh, no, so the for the single energy scans, for the mice stuff, it was five minutes. For the dual energy scans, it's three hours. It's one and a half hours per energy. And the reason why the erbium oxide cannot re-aggregate is because it is now entrapped in, in, in a silicon matrix. So the, the silicon, I add, I'm adding a curing agent. So the silicon actually perfuses through the vessels and then cures into a silicon cast. So it, it, it can't re-aggregate and it's got nowhere to go. And you know, along the same thought process, I could vary that curing time, but what I was aiming for was about 45 minutes. So I had 45 minutes till it was fully cured. So I just let it run through until it cured and then just stopped flowing. Sky in, in the joint are partially vascular. Mm -hmm. Can you see sort that? Of, sort of and see the menisci? Oh, yeah. I wish I had any images for that, but no, I, I, they definitely are getting perfused 100%. Um, unfortunately, I have no images on this presentation to show you that, but they, they do light up like crazy. And my second question is. Can you then dissolve the bone and end up with a cast, uh, just like they do for lungs and stuff? So I actually did that for fun, too. Um, you have a lot of fun, I guess. <laughs> it's great when your boss just is not there and you can do whatever you want. Um, yeah, I actually did that for fun. And yes, I can do it. I, it just, the only problem with it was no, it's not that it was stable. It's that I was using old samples, so it took a weeks of uh, decalcification and a lot of rocking. But it was really cool in the end. You could, I could see this perfused limb, and I could just see erbium's pink, by the way. So I could see all these pink lines everywhere in it where the vessels were. But yes, absolutely can decalcify it. Does nothing to the silicon. So you would be left with a pink cast of the vasculature which you can dye any color you want. You can dye silicone any color you want. Yes, sir. The one result that you had, you know, uh, where vascularization yeah. increased after one week that, you know, you associate that possibly with inflammation and due to surgery. But wouldn't you have seen the same thing that is the sham surgery? But the sham surgery wasn't as, as invasive. The sham surgery only involved opening the joint capsule, but not touching the ACL or the meniscus. So it might not have been invasive enough for it to respond as drastically as the OA surgery. So when we do ACL sham surgery, we do exactly everything the same. We actually even hook the ACL, we go there, we the oh, really? The only thing we don't do is that cut it. Cup. So your sham surgery was not that identical then? I guess, no, not that identical. We did open the joint capsule, but that was it. The other thing that I was wondering, so, so what's required for the in vivo application of, of this? What, what steps have to be Yes. Basically the pharmacokinetics. Um, it has to be cleared. It has to be cleared within a reasonable amount of time. It can't aggregate anywhere. It has to be small enough size. And the biggest problem that she was facing is I can pump as much <laughs> erbium oxide as I want into silicon and the mouse is not going to care. The rat's not going to care. The problem with her is that she needs enough contrast enhancement that you can see it, but not enough for it to either fall out of suspension and not be properly encapsulated with the um, surfactant. So right now she has it working. It works. She has mice that have lived. That's great. Um, the problem right now is that the dual energy CT has to be customized for her. So I can scan for three hours long. She can't. Not only is the contrast agent 
uh, constantly circling through, uh, circulating through the body and being excreted and filtered through the kidneys, but you can't scan a live animal for three hours. So there have been talks on how to get this, how to, to do rapid, uh, rapid KVP switching and rapid uh, filter switching, but I unfortunately left before that really got anywhere. There's people in Calgary that are very interested in angiogenesis following heart attack. Yep. And a heart attack type of model, you know, and superimposing a certain treatment patch to see whether or not that actually helps in the angiogenesis mm -hmm. of the infarcted area or not. So if you were interested of course. In, in something like that, then maybe you should chat at some point. Absolutely. I think, but you don't need erbium. If you're around the heart, there's no bones. You can just use iodine, which is already clinically acceptable. So you just need to be able to see something versus nothing. And well, the approach that they're using, that, or trying to use, is that we that try to make the, the heart completely transfer, translucent mm -hmm. so that when we then inject the, the compass agent, only the vessels will be there and the heart will actually be completely translucent anyway. Interesting. So you know, you have, you have read about the, the translucent mice and tissues. Yes. That people are doing that. Yes. That's the type of approach that we're trying to use. We'll definitely have to touch base then. I'm curious. Because then you get rid of any segmentation issues. Yes, you do. Because all the rest that you don't want is essentially uh, sure. yeah. invisible. We'll talk after. Sure. I'm very interested. Sorry. So in um, ligament healing, yes. you know, there's a big burst of angiogenesis and the scar, and then it retracts. And there might be some changes at the uh, insertions. Yes. <clears throat> Where the bone yeah. Can you detect the um, blood um, supply of the, like the immediate collateral ligament? I don't see why not. Um, have I looked at it? No, but anywhere my contrast agent goes, I will detect. It's as simple as that. It's so if my vessel, if my contrast agent can perfuse those vessels, then I don't see why I cannot detect them. It's just a matter of somebody going in and then knowing where it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your live models, uh, do you know if there's an issue with toxicity with the amount of nanoparticles that you have to refuse in? Yeah, she... Yeah. What, what Most of the mice died initially. <laughs> um, <laughs> right now, one, as far as I know, that's been aptly named Irby, has been alive for two and a half years. But unfortunately, the two brethren that he was perfused with passed away within 24 hours. However, she has since done, I believe, oof, I'd say more than 10 and they're all alive. So whatever the concentration is, she's kind of nailed it down. The, the bone up hypothesis of OA in the vascularization of the cartilage, it's associated with a bunch of other things. Yeah. You get the, the subcondral bone marching up higher and the calcified cartilage becomes bone, yep. and the cartilage becomes calcified cartilage, and you yep. get that endochondral cal, uh, calcification. And one thing that's upsetting with your model after you do this injury is you don't see changes to bone. Okay, so that's not saying whatever you're saying is wrong. I should preface, sorry, the reason I say this, I should preface this is that you always try to avoid the bad things, right, about your own project. So you have to remember, I'm drawing a VOI around, and it follows the cortical shell, right, around and everything. I'm drawing a massive VOI, so any subtle changes I'm not going to pick up because it gets diluted over this whole entire VOI. So what's funny is the surgical model that this is based off of, they did notice bone changes in the subchondral bone, but they were only using, I think it was one by one cylinders in very specific places of the trabecular bone, right? So they're looking at very- One by one mil? Yes, one by one mil, sorry. Yeah. In very specific places around the trabecular bone. I'm looking at everything. So any small changes, I'm not gonna see. So if I were to go in there and customize where you want that ROI, you might see what you are. It's just, 
I, I need it dirt and simple, which is follow a line, and that's what I did. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and, but maybe if I can poke more holes in the model. Um, the, that hypothesis is also built around uh, uh, aversion. Yes. Remodeling. Yep. And you're not going to get aversion remodeling in a rodent model unless you're really inducing some serious book damage to the bone itself. So, yeah. and I don't really understand how you would get that vascularization in, unless there was aversion type of remodeling, unless you had a, a an osteum that's kind of moving up through the subcomponent. And I don't so. get it. I don't, I don't recall ever seeing even one that got there, so. But it was interesting to tie in the whole hypothesis and and so why don't your results, I, I kind of lost you at the end there with why don't your results sort of refute the hypothesis? They don't refute, oh, they don't refute the overall microvascular hypothesis. They just don't show it. Oh, You don't think they do? Because well, there's still the synovium, I would see. I, okay. So literature, the problem with literature is that people think that if you, if, if you look at cartilage degeneration, people think that... Uh, if you don't get enough nutrients, then you get degradation of cartilage. So where it's getting its nutrients? Well, I've seen anywhere the synovium, I've seen anywhere in literature said that the synovium provides anywhere from 60 to about 90% of the nutrients. And that's huge. And the problem is it's just because no one can, under, can study the one below it, like the subconscious bone thing. Okay, would you be bold enough then to say that in this model, the bone up hypothesis of OA is done for? Well, not done for, but has not been supported. No, I don't think so. It's just because. But you don't see any changes to the bone. But it's a huge ROI. It's a huge VOI. There are there are problems. It's just with the way that it's. It, it's just really the VOI can can dilute any signal that we can see. So we were looking for big signals. So if I had, and the other thing is I contoured the cortical shell because. There were several things that went into this. The cortical, cortical shell is very thick, and it already adds a huge part of the signal that I receive in the grayscale value, or like the overall voxel volume fraction. And ideally, I would have just got the trabecular bone, but we can't. It's very, very hard to manually contour just the inside of that cortical bone 108 times, a thousand times, like for every slice. So that's why I drew through the cortical bone in hopes of A, catching a vessel that does cross through it but it was just for simplicity. So there is a lot of, I'm not disproving it, I'm just thinking that what I did, we don't show a difference, but it's not saying the whole model is you know, not valid. Dave, I think I'll be the last one. Oh, yeah, I think sometimes we forget there's multiple kinds of OA. Yeah. This PTOA is yeah. one of them. Um, so I think we need to keep that in mind. And yes, this is just the surgical approach. There are chemical approaches, mechanical approaches, and stuff like that. Metabolic approaches. Yes. Are these all male mites? Yes, they are. And so it's also restricted to Yes, it is also restricted to that. And you didn't I, that. Well, I did say we had 54 male oh, okay. spectral rats. I didn't. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. So I was thinking about the theory with the. A bone and reduces the kind of OA. So if humans uh, rupture the ACL, mm -hmm. it's normally a highly dynamic situation. And if the ACL ruptures, the femur crashes kind of way on the tibia mm -hmm. and leaves a lesion to the subcontral bone. So you find the bone bruise in the bone. So could this actually be more the reason for the development of the cartilage than? Because the bone is actually injured and not only the ligament, because this kind of, I mean, it's a very nice approach to cut the ACL and yes. then look what happens, but this is kind of, uh, as far as I know, it happens not very often. It's isolated pairs of the ACL. No, that's and great. So maybe you could induce such a thing into your mind, like creating, I don't know, kind of dynamic deterioration of the, of the ACL and the whole knee joint. That it's not just uh, cutting of the ACL. Yeah, so there is a paper that did, 
if I recall correctly, they did do the ACLX PMM surgery, but they also induced um, cyclical loading. So they actually loaded the rats on a uh, rotating drum and they just forced them to run on the injured leg. Um, the paper is by Dave Mackerling and uh, what's his name? Tom Appleton, if you're interested in it. So they did do that already. The, the other evidence that has come out of the keg, um, Andres Crooker defended his PhD last year, and he, he showed exactly what you're saying. So at the, in humans, at the site of the bone bruise is where you tend to lose the most bone. So overall, you have a net loss, but it's significantly greater within the bone bruise than the other bone surrounding it. So yeah. what that means down the road, we don't know still. So this was, they, he followed them for eight months after it. Yeah, it's just because if we want to explain, from my point of view, how the cartilage changes due to changes in the bone or in the joint, and if we have actually an injury of the bone, this could highly influence uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the cartilage uh, tissues. Yeah. If they are vascularized directly by yes. the region. Sorry, I, I mistook that. I thought that was a statement more than a question.